Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new here, hi, hello, my name's Georgia and on my platforms here on the internet I talk about unsolved true crime. For the most part, today's video is not one of those things. Today I have a story for you that I've wanted to tell for a really long time. It's one of those tales that a lot of people kind of take for granted that they know the true story, that the version of events put forward by the media is very much the correct one. But what if that's not the case? What if there's more to it, that things aren't as meets the eye? Most of us have probably heard of the infamous 1994 figure skating attack, when Tonya Harding brutally attacked rival Nancy Kerrigan, smashing her knee and ruining all hopes of glory. But of course, that's not really happened. The story hasn't been morphed, exaggerated over the past 29 years, to the point that now a lot of people don't know what really happened anymore and the context around it. Well, that's what I'm here for. For a moment, Tonya Harding really was the most hated woman in America, but no human is black and white, there's always the grey, and Tonya very much sat in the grey. But first, I want to thank Audible for sponsoring this video. I have been absolutely loving Audible this year. One of my New Year's resolutions was to listen to more audiobooks, to consume more non-fiction content, and Audible has been pretty vital to me achieving that goal. Today we're talking about the true story of Tonya Harding, diving into her history and the institutions that surrounded her, and Tonya has been far from the only victim of the sporting world. As I learned through the Audible podcast, Ashley vs WWE, the true story of Ashley Mazzaro. Ashley Mazzaro was a radiant person, a bikini model, a WWE wrestler, a performer to her core. This is the story of her fight, both inside and outside of the ring. Ashley Mazzaro was an American professional wrestler who managed to gain a lot of popularity in a very short amount of time. She became one of the most popular WWE performers from 2005 to 2008. But for Ashley, this was not a happy time. Eight years after leaving the company, she testified that she was sexually assaulted whilst working with the WWE, and she had been warned not to go public with this story. The following few years would be incredibly stressful for her and they really would take their toll, leading to her taking her own life in 2019. Ashley's story, as told through the podcast, is absolutely heartbreaking and it's not something I ever would have known about before listening to this on Audible. I mean, I've never really had much of an interest in the world of wrestling, but I just learned so much in this podcast. So it just goes to show, if you sort of push yourself out of your comfort zones, you will find amazing things to listen to. I highly recommend you go give this a listen. You can use Audible's free 30-day trial to do so, and then you can go and peruse the rest of their content, this never-ending library of fresh and exciting audiobooks and podcasts. I just absolutely adore Audible, and I know that you guys would too. So, Tonya Harding was born November 12th, 1970, in Portland, Oregon, to her parents, Albert Harding and Lavonna Golden. It's very important to note for this story that the Hardings were not a well-off family. Tonya was the youngest of four children. Tonya's father struggled to keep down a job due to poor health. And when he did have a job, it wasn't a well-paid one. And her mother worked as a waitress. But that didn't stop Tonya first stepping on the ice when she was just three years old, with it being very clear from that very first moment that she had this natural aptitude towards skating. She picked up immediately. Lavonna would say that whatever the other people were doing on the ice, Tonya was able to just follow them and do the exact same thing. She wasn't supposed to be able to do that at three years old, but she could. It was so clear from early on that she had a natural strength and a natural aptitude towards skating that a lot of other kids just didn't really have. Tonya would compete in her first competition the following year, aged just four years old, and from there, she was pretty unstoppable. Tonya was raised in East Portland, which is thought by many to be sort of like rougher side of the city, and she started her skating lessons at the Lloyd Centre Mall, like I said, when she was around three years old. She would later go on to train at the Clackamas Town Centre Mall. So literally, she was learning to skate in these ice rinks in malls, Clackamas surrounded by Chick-fil-A and hot dog on a stick. In her training, Tonya didn't really have a lot of the chances of other skaters. She rose through the ranks purely through determination, grit, hard work, and honestly, a lot of rage, I'm sure. 
Rage is one hell of a motivator. Tonya's home life was really tough. And where a lot of other kids in a very similar position may have gone off the rails, Tonya channeled it into her sport. It wasn't a given that Tonya was ever gonna be able to get to the Olympics coming from her mall skating rink. She had to be the best. I mean, even later on when she was actually training for the Olympics, she was still training in the mall. Ice skating, figure skating is a very expensive sport to pursue. It's much more than just a pair of skates. You've got to pay for costumes, coaches, rink hire, competition entries, travel across the country to and from the competitions. If you're in a sort of tricky financial situation, ice skating is probably not the best sport to put your kids through. I mean, even if you're successful, you're only really able to earn a living through this sport at the very top, top levels. And even then, you need sponsorships, you need endorsements. And this is something Tonya would struggle with throughout her entire career, because brands weren't willing to endorse her. But we'll talk more about that in sort of later in the episode. Sometimes Tonya would skate without a meal in her stomach, without knowing if her parents, or later herself, would even be able to afford another lesson. The future was always unsure, but she kept at it. Despite the tough financial situation, Tonya's parents dedicated themselves to ensuring that she got the training that she needed, thinking that maybe this could be the way to claw themselves out of poverty. This could be their pass, their passage to a better life. But life was always very tough for Tonya, with her claiming that around the age of sort of six or seven, her mother began physically and mentally abusing her. She later said, she became very abusive and was drinking all day long, beating me, dragging me off the rink, hitting me with a hairbrush, right in front of everyone. Lavona, of course, has always denied these allegations. She's done new shows in just the past few years, still denying them. She said that she did hit Tonya once at a skating rink out of anger, but she didn't abuse her. That she lost control as a parent and became abusive. There are people who believe that you have been abusive to Tonya. Well, if I was, I must not have been there. <laughs> must have been someplace else because I don't remember it. Not abusive ever. Corrective, maybe. Not abusive, not physically abusive. The mother-daughter relationship here has always been fraught. There's video footage of Tonya at just 16 years old saying that she doesn't like her mother and that she's abusive. A lot of teenagers don't really get along with their parents, but this undeniably seemed deeper, darker than that. However, Tonya has always said that she got along with her father. She was a self-described daddy's girl. And whilst I think he very much did have his own issues, he remained very close with his daughter and very supportive of her. So at least she had him. In 2008, a book called The Tonya Tapes was released, which was essentially a book of transcripts of interviews conducted with Tonya through the late 90s, sort of like early noughties. I think the interviews were supposed to be eventually turned into an autobiography, but it just never transpired, so they were just transcribed and released by Linda Prowse instead. But the Tonya tapes were kind of Tonya's first chance of telling her own story in her own words, her first attempt to take control of the narrative surrounding her. She would have done these interviews, like I said, in the late 90s, and everything went down in 1994. In the Tonya tapes, Tonya speaks at length about her childhood and her trauma, the things she had to endure. Now, of course, this is all her version of events. There's very few ways of actually fact-checking specific things that she says happened as a child, but there are certain things that have been confirmed through witnesses. You know, my personal feelings is that child never stood a chance. Absolutely never stood a chance. But Pat Hamill thinks she knows the real Sandy Golden. Pat's daughter, Janine, took skating lessons with Tanya Harding when they were both young girls. I've seen her slapped. I saw her uh, at one time, one occasion, she was sitting on a chair and her mother, uh, she was, was brought off the ice because she was doing something wrong on the ice. Her mother brought her in, sat her down in the chair, and they were having a conversation and slapped Tanya and knocked Tanya off the chair. People have said that basically you were the mother from hell. I wouldn't call myself an abusive mother, nor would I say she had a bad childhood. And then some people, they don't figure that it's right to swat a bottom. I think if a bottom's needed to be swatted, fine. So you did spank her? Swat is not spank. Spank is putting over your knees and going whop, 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 or whatever. I did not ever do that. 
An article in The Vulture by Jordan Cricciola says that according to a woman who took lessons at the same rink as Harding, Lavonna did often shout at her daughter about how she's paid for her to practice, so she is going to stay on the ice and practice no matter what. This meant that on multiple occasions, Tonya was forced to pee herself on the ice. She wasn't even allowed to leave the ice to go to the toilet. Fellow skaters and childhood friends would also confirm that Lavonna hit Tonya with a hairbrush on more than one occasion. Tonya said, I remember she dragged me into the bathroom and beat me with a hairbrush, literally. Tonya also alleges that her mother threw a steak knife at her once when she tried to leave the house in the middle of a conversation, something which Lavonna has since denied. But sort of either way you look at it, no matter who you want to believe, it's very undeniable that Tonya's upbringing was tough. She's also alleged that her half-brother Chris would also molest her as a child, and she goes quite in-depth in that in Tonya tapes, so I don't really think I need to share that with you, it's quite dark. If Tonya was indeed dealing with all this as a child, and a lot of it can be proven, then it's pretty incredible that she was able to step on the ice and do what she did. I mean, her power on the ice was always undeniable, and she trained throughout her youth with a coach called Diane Rawlinson. From 13 years old, Tonya started working her way through the competitive skating world. Whilst other competitors had custom-made costumes, custom-made dresses, Tonya's were handmade by her mother in what people would often laugh at as old-fashioned styles. Tonya's competing in the 80s, wearing costumes that went out of style in the 60s, her mother making costumes that would have been in style for her own ice skating dreams two decades beforehand. And in the world of figure skating, appearance is everything. The association that oversees the sport in the USA is the USFSA, US Figure Skating Association, and I'm going to be referring to them a lot in this video. The USFSA always had a very specific idea of what a figure skater should be, the epitome of femininity. It's classic, isn't it, that in a sport that should be focused on athleticism, appearance is judged just as heavily as technique. A woman must always look beautiful to succeed, and appearance is something that judges have to take into consideration when judging a score. It's called presentation. And this is often an area in which Tonya Harding ran into trouble, because while she was undeniably a beautiful skater and a beautiful person, she didn't look how skaters were expected to look. So much of her later success in the field would come because of her power. In 1991, she would be the first American woman to ever land a triple axel in competition, to huge acclaim. Tonya did jumps that no one else could do. She could do programs that no one else could do. But this is because of her body type. Unlike her skating peers, Tonya had muscles. And whilst I would never ever say in a million years that Tonya was overweight or big in any way because she simply wasn't, she was seen as big in the sport with unseemly, unfeminine muscles. This isn't something she could change, like it was why she was so successful in the sport but it would often count against her. Instead of being graceful and ballet-like, she was powerful. So Tonya had that working against her and the fact that she was just from the wrong side of the tracks. No matter how hard Tonya worked to get to where she did, the fact that she literally worked in the mall she skated in so she could pay for her time on the rink, it always worked against her. She was always judged on her socio-economic background. She was white trash, trailer trash, undeserving of her place in figure skating, which is undeniably one of the snobbiest sports to be a part of, backed up by many people involved in the world at this time. That's not my words, that's other people's words. Many people said that you'd be hard pressed to find a snobbier sport, a judgier sport. And then on top of all that, there was the fact that her costumes were homemade and often out of style. Tonya saying that one year she had a bright pink costume that she'd made herself. She thought it was really, really pretty, but one of the judges came up to her afterwards and said that if she ever wore anything like that again at a US championship, she would never do another. Apparently in response to that, she told them where to go and that if they were able to come up with $5,000 for a costume for her, then she'd wear something different. But until then, stay out of her face. Rightly so. Tonya grew up as a tomboy. In a sport in which femininity was considered optimum, Tonya spent her spare time hunting and fishing with her dad, chopping firewood, smoking and drinking. 
She was considered to have a gruff personality. She just didn't fit the mould. She had to go on ice and try to perform in what she thought was an acceptable version of femininity, what she thought was the right version of femininity. But no matter how hard she tried, she never quite seemed to get it right. Tonya was, is a woman, but she was constantly being told that she wasn't enough of a woman, wasn't the right kind of woman, she was always wrong. So the thing getting Tonya down in her competitions was the presentation score, which is made up of five factors. You have skating skills, composition, so choreography, transitions, interpretation, and performance. And it would always be the latter that Tonya would fall victim to, because that included scores on how skaters carried themselves and personality. You had to be likeable, and Tonya in the figure skating world just wasn't. There's an amazing article from 2017 by Sarah Marshall, which is called Making an Ice Queen. And Sarah Marshall is the host of my favorite podcast, You're Wrong About. I highly recommend you go and listen to it. But she's also an incredible journalist. I really enjoy her writing. And this article is basically all about how Tonya was turned into a villainess in the eyes of the media and therefore in the eyes of the public. I just have to read you this excerpt from the article because I don't think I could word it any better if I tried. What she didn't understand was what every choreographer, every coach, every advertising executive, every skating official, and every judge didn't dare tell her. And something I had to stare at her story for years in the end to finally see. More feminine meant weaker. They didn't want her to put on more makeup or skate to classical music or wear more sparkles. They wanted her to look less strong. Tonya's story was where I learned how your wearing lots of blue eyeshadow can eventually be used against you by the public as proof that you are a nasty, wicked, violent person. How not appearing feminine enough in the way society tells you to appear can later be taken as evidence of your role in a violent crime. And so, as Tonya grew, she learned to lean into her power, into her apparent lack of femininity. Instead of doing her programmes to classical music like so many of her peers, at the 1991 US Championship, she would perform her long programme to the Batman soundtrack, which then turned into Send in the Clowns by Sondheim, and she finished on Wild Thing by Tone Lock. It would be in this very same performance that she would land her historic triple axle, the second ever woman and the first American woman to do so. What perhaps sums Tonya up perfectly is her reaction to this afterwards. She was so excited to land the triple axle that she takes a moment in the middle of her program to celebrate, punching the air and yelling out. It's not graceful, but it's pure happiness and excitement that she can't help but just let out. She had such passion for her sport. But I've jumped ahead a bit there. So basically leading up to this point in 1991, throughout the 80s, Tonya is climbing up the circuit. Each win, each appearance, getting her closer to her dreams of the Olympics. And then in the late 80s, something happened in the sport which hugely benefited Tonya. One of the reasons I love my job, I love doing this, I love researching, it's my favourite part of what I do, is because I always end up learning something new, something rogue that I would never usually come across. And I feel like now I have a much deeper understanding of the entire history of figure skating that I just didn't have a month ago. So you see, for years, figure skating compromised of two segments. There was free skating and compulsory figures. Now, free skating is basically what we all know today as figure skating, but you might not have heard of compulsory figures, which is pretty much exactly as it sounds. Skaters would have to skate shapes over the ice with the judges looking for balance, smoothness, and precision. As you became more accomplished in compulsory figures, the more complicated the figures grew. I mean, I'm not talking about just like skating in a perfect square or a perfect circle. Like these would be like complicated figures that you'd have to skate spot on. Like the lines had to be exactly over the shapes. I mean, judges would literally have to get on their hands and knees on the ice looking for precision down to the millimeter. It was very, very difficult to be perfect and it made for a very boring spectator sport. This wasn't exactly something the public would want to come out and watch. This was judges only. And importantly, that meant there wasn't really much money in compulsory figures. 
and that I am sure did play into the International Skating Union's decision to discontinue compulsory figures as part of competitions in 1990. Many countries had already discontinued them in their like national competitions including the USA two years earlier but now compulsory figures just weren't a thing anymore. And of course, as you'd expect, they did have this very mixed bag of responses to this decision. Some people argue that compulsory figures taught skaters indispensable skills, alignment, core strength, control and discipline. Many argued that getting rid of them and only focusing on free skates would turn skating into jumping contests and simply cause more injuries. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not that's true. But the problem was that the two skills, the precision of compulsory figures and the power of free skating were sort of directly in competition with each other. They juxtaposed each other. So much so that it was impossible to be good at both. So to bring this full circle back around to Tonya, you could already guess why this was good news for her. She had the power, the energy for free skating. She was never quite as good at the compulsory figures. Suddenly, the sport was leaning towards her particular skill set. If I had to guess, I'd say that this is why in the 90s, figure skaters suddenly became celebrities in the media, one of the most popular sports in the USA. I mean, what happened with Tonya Harding very much did lead to this big boom, this big interest in the sport, but even before that point, it was very much growing. The sport suddenly became much more thrilling to watch. It catapulted the skaters' stardom that just had never been seen before. The pressure suddenly put on these young women was unimaginable. Throughout the late 80s or early 90s, there were three American skaters that people were watching very, very carefully. Tonya Harding, of course, Christy Yamaguchi and Nancy Kerrigan. All three were constantly vying for the gold, but it would be Nancy that Tonya would often be pitted against, because Nancy was considered to be the polar opposite of white trash Tonya. Now ironically, Nancy grew up poor as well in a working class family, but her story just played out completely differently. I mean, like Tonya's mother, Nancy's father would work three jobs to fund her lessons, even driving the Zamboni at the rink in exchange for lessons. If things kind of played out differently, the pair could have been friends, partners, as they rose through the skating world. And whilst I don't think there was sort of necessarily bad blood until the events of 1994, they were constantly pit against each other. Nancy was feminine, perfect, in all the ways that Tonya wasn't. She was dainty with this massive smile, dark hair, feminine movements. Where Tonya had power, Nancy had elegance, femininity. Nancy was the perfect idea of an ice princess, and therefore she's the one who got all the endorsements and the sponsorships. Her skating outfits would come to be designed by Vera Wang. Companies wanted Nancy as the face of their company. Companies didn't want Tonya. It must have been unbelievably frustrating. And I don't say any of this to justify what would come to happen. I'm just very much trying to set the scene here. So in 1986, Tonya places sixth at the US Figure Skating Championships and then fifth in 1987 and 88. She was third in 1989. Later that year, she won the Skate America competition and going into the 1990 championships, she was considered to be one of the strongest competitors, but she was ill, had a poor free skate and she finished seventh overall. Nancy Kerrigan in this time was very close behind her. She was 12th in 88, 5th in 89. In 1990, Nancy beat Tonya coming 4th. Nancy was also actually really held back by the compulsory figures that she was also very poor at. So as soon as they sort of removed them from the competition, Nancy also started to thrive. It was in 1991 that Tonya would make her really big breakthrough though in the skating world, landing that triple axle I spoke about earlier, the first American woman to do so in competition. In the long program, she actually landed seven triple jumps, including the axle. She won the 1991 US Ladies Singles title with the first 6.0 technical score since 1973, 6.0 being a full mark. In March 1991, she competed at the International World Championships alongside Nancy Kerrigan and Christy Yamaguchi, and all three ended up on the podium as a full American sweep. Christy would win gold, Tonya got silver, and Nancy got bronze. 
Throughout 1991, Tonya is breaking records left, right and centre. She landed the triple axel in the long programme and then in the short. She was the first woman ever to execute two triple axles in a single competition. She was the first ever to complete a triple axel in a combination with a double toe loop. This was just a kind of athleticism never before seen in the sport and as you can imagine, it catapulted her into the spotlight. In the 1992 Winter Olympics in Albertville in France, she finished fourth, so just off the podium. But in this time, Tonya's personal life was struggling immensely. A few years before this, aged just 15, Tonya had met a boy two years her senior called Jeff Galuli. They are immediately taken with each other and this was the first boy to ever really show Tonya any attention, so she falls for him. This would be the beginning of a very complicated, on again, off again, abusive relationship that would ultimately prove to be her downfall. It really didn't take long after meeting for Jeff to become abusive, both physically and mentally, but you've got to remember that this is all Tonya had ever known. Her mum hit her and loved her, so Jeff could hit her and still love her. Abuse is a kind of cruel cycle like that. Just like with her mother, the true level of abuse can only be known by those involved. There's no really proof of anything. But if we take Tonya's word for it, the abuse from Jeff was pretty awful. She tells one story about how after one particularly bad fight, she tried to escape, to drive away with only the clothes on her back and her skating bags. But Jeff catches her and rips the wires from the car so she can't start it. Panicked, Tonya just starts running through the streets, through the woods, trying to escape him as he puts the wires back in the car and drives up behind her. As she can hear the van, she's sort of hiding behind poles so he can't see her. All Tonya is thinking about is getting to a safe space because he is going to hurt her. She wants to call for help and eventually she does. But this story is terrifying. It made me feel my heart beating in my chest. If Tonya's story is to be believed, this wasn't just a case of her being hit every so often, which is horrific abuse in itself. This was actual terror, fear, being chased through the streets, not being allowed to leave the situation. Their relationship was incredibly turbulent, but four years in, in 1990, she marries him. And then just one year later, she files for divorce. According to Tonya's own version of events in the Tonya tapes, she talks about how the FSA didn't love the idea of Tonya being a divorcee. I mean, every time she stepped out on the ice, apparently, she was representing the sport, the association. And she was already a questionable figure in this world. She got married aged just 19, and here she was at 20 now, just wanting a divorce. In a country like the USA, that places so much on family values, on Christian values, no, it looks better for them if she stays in an abusive marriage. So in 1992, she withdraws her divorce petition despite the awful position that she's found herself in. However, the next year, in 1993, it seems she had a change of heart and the divorce was finalised, although the couple did remain living together in Portland and they still called each other husband and wife, it just wasn't legal anymore. It was a very strange situation, I very much get the idea that they were very sort of dependent on each other, they didn't really know how to live without each other. So all of this is happening and then in December 1993, she finishes fourth in a world skating competition in Japan, which was a huge disappointment in the lead up to the 1994 Olympics. Which I suppose brings us to the attack to 1994. On the 6th of January, Nancy was walking back down the corridor after her practice session towards the dressing room, when a man came up to her and bludgeoned her in the right leg with a police baton before immediately running away to escape. He ran into a locked door, we don't think he realised it was locked, and he shattered it, escaping through the broken panes. He managed to leave the scene without being caught, although that freedom wouldn't last for very long. Now luckily for Nancy, her assailant seemed to have pretty bad aim. He was clearly aiming for her knee, but instead he hit her just above it. What should have been a broken kneecap ended up just being severe bruising of her muscles. It was still immensely painful in the moment, although luckily it wasn't career ending, although Nancy had no way of knowing that at the time. Seeing as the cameras had been following her for this TV segment, there's infamous footage of Nancy sitting on the floor surrounded by staff, just crying out, why, why, why? 
this footage we broadcast around the world. It was front pages of all the newspapers the next morning on all the news programs. This clip is infamous. Now, incredibly quickly, the attention was on Tonya Harding as a suspect for this, or at least it was speculated that she had hired the hitman to carry out the attack but there had to be a whole investigation for anyone could actually come to that conclusion. It's said that Nancy Kerrigan's coach said immediately, like, look at Tonya Harding for this. Two days after the attack, Tonya went on to the championships and she won the US title. She came first, meaning that she qualified for the Olympics. Even though Nancy obviously did not skate due to her injury, she was also chosen to represent the USA, her track record speaking for itself. Michelle Kwan, another name you probably recognise, ended up taking home second place and she should technically have qualified, but she was just 13 years old at this time, and I do wonder if that played into the decision to take Nancy instead of taking her. Michelle instead became first alternate. Tonya said to the press in the aftermath of her win that she hoped Nancy would be able to compete at the Olympics, but nevertheless, she would whip her butt. Tonya would later say that this was genuine. She really, really hoped that Nancy would make it to the Olympics because a gold wouldn't truly count if she wasn't competing against the best. But by this point, investigators are already watching Tonya closely. On January 7th, just one day after the attack, the police received an anonymous phone call from a woman who suggested that the police talk to Jeff Galuli, Tonya's ex-husband, and Sean Eckhart, Jeff's friend who was acting as Tonya's bodyguard. Almost straight away, it became very, very clear that they had something to do with this attack. On the 9th, investigators released composite drawings of the man suspected of attacking Nancy, and two days after that, the FBI begins looking into the allegation that Sean Eckhart and Jeff Galuli had orchestrated this attack. A man, a minister from Portland, tells investigators that he had heard a tape of Eckhart, Galuli, and a man called Shane Stant discussing a hit. And from there, it all comes together pretty quickly because the very next day on January 12th, 1994, Sean Eckhart confesses to the FBI, implicating Jeff Galuli, Shane Stant, Derek Smith, and Tonya Harding herself. Multnomah County authorities quickly arrest both Eckhart and Smith, charging them with conspiracy to commit second degree assault. Soon after, Stant surrenders in Arizona and he's charged with just straight conspiracy to assault. All of this is pretty common knowledge within the media and the skating world of bigger skating officials meet to decide whether Tonya should be allowed to compete in the Olympics the very next month. In the end, it's decided that she should be allowed since no actual evidence had emerged to suggest that she was involved or had any prior knowledge of the attack, and she repeatedly denied any involvement. Although very quickly after this, she was under investigation by the FBI. At the same time all this is going on, Nancy resumes practicing, her legs healed within 10 days. She held a press conference after most of those involved had been charged, in which she tried to remain positive about her Olympic chances. On the 18th of January, so 12 days post-attack, Tonya underwent questioning by both the DA and the FBI, an interview that lasted for over 10 hours. During the interview, she insisted that she knew nothing of the attack, that the most she'd been involved was dropping Jeff off and picking him up from Sean's house on the 11th of January. She didn't know what was happening in the house, they were friends, they hung out a lot, apparently she dropped him there all the time. She was warned in this interview that whilst concealing criminal knowledge didn't violate Oregon law, it did violate federal laws if she lied to the FBI. And I suppose this is where the entire mystery in this episode lies, because to this day, no one really knows the true extent of what Tonya did and didn't know. No one knows how much she was truly involved in this, although of course people have their many, many opinions. Tonya would go on Diane Sawyer and say that she'd done nothing wrong. Jeff Galuli first testified in front of the FBI 20 days after the attack, and his testimony was as follows. He said that in early December 1993, Tonya called him upset about her placement at the NHK trophy competition. He said that he was also upset on her behalf and was later talking to his friend Sean about the politics of the figure skating world, which is when Sean pondered what would happen if Nancy Kerrigan were to receive a threat. Jeff said he immediately liked the idea and they started to plot an attack, injuring Nancy. According to Jeff's version of events, Sean wanted to keep the idea secret from Tonya, but Jeff thought it would affect her performance if she thought there was somebody out there going and attacking figure skaters, it might mean she performs worse. 
So he claims that he told her about this and he said that she thought it was a good idea but was very skeptical about Sean's ability to plan such a thing. And it's worth bearing in mind that at the absolute worst, if you believe everything Jeff says to the letter, this is the full extent of Tonya's involvement in this attack. That it was mentioned to her and she said it was a good idea, maybe she dropped him at a few meetings. She wasn't actually involved in the direct planning or the actual attack. I'm not saying that makes her innocent by any stretch of the imagination, but people seem to have this idea that Tonya was the one who personally attacked Nancy Kerrigan, that she was much more involved than it's thought that she is. You've got to remember that Jeff may have had ulterior motives for wanting Tonya to look bad. She had publicly denounced their relationship in the days before this testimony, and she was doing everything she could to distance herself from him in the media to make him look like the bad guy. I'm not saying that he is 100% lying, nor am I saying he's 100% telling the truth, only he knows that. But I'm just saying we can't take his word at face value. But he did have no reason to protect Tonya at this point. Protecting her was only going to be worse for him, and we know he was abusive. He didn't necessarily ever have her best interests at heart. Eckhart would also testify that on January 1st, 1994, he met Jeff and Tonya at the rink and Tonya told him, you need to stop screwing around with this and get it done. Eckhart spoke on the phone with Derek Smith, an acquaintance he used to work with, to organise the hit. Smith quoted $4,500 to do it. Jeff said all they had was $2,000, so they settled on that at this point. At this point, they were doing all of this for just $2,000, but more money would come in the future. There was also talk of a permanent position as Tonya's bodyguard for $1,000 a week, which is something they'd be able to afford if Tonya got the gold medal. This was why they were doing this, so Tonya could win the gold medal and then have the money on the back of that. Like, surely she was gonna get more sponsorships, endorsements, media deals if she won the gold. This was the ultimate. On Christmas Day in 1993, Jeff received a message on his answering machine from Smith asking for more details about the plan, and he claims that then he called Eckhart to cancel the deal, he was having cold feet. But Eckhart replied that Smith was already driving to Portland to see it through, and that he needed more information about Nancy. He said he needed a photograph of her and the location of the ice rink where she practiced. Now what is possibly the most damning evidence against Tonya in this case is that two days after this she phones her friend Vera and asks her where Nancy trains. She tells Vera on the phone that she had a bet with Jeff that she wanted to win and she needs to find out. Vera then finds out the information and calls back later leaving a message that was quite difficult to understand. Tonya wrote out on a scrap piece of paper Tony Can Arena instead of Tony Kent Arena. Now this is pretty damning evidence, it certainly seems like she's trying to find out where Nancy trains. However, it's not solid proof that Tonya knew anything. For all we know, Jeff really did engage her in a conversation and a bet about where Nancy trained. Or maybe she was involved. What we do know is it wasn't enough for the FBI to say 100% that Tonya was involved. On December 27th, Derek Smith and his nephew Shane Stant arrived in Portland and drove to Eckhart's home, asking for a meeting with Jeff the very next day. Tonya would be the one to drop Jeff off at this meeting, but she denies knowing what the meeting was about. She said he spent a lot of time with Sean, they were friends, why would she think anything of it? In this meeting, Jeff and the other men discussed the details of this attack, they brainstormed ideas. Jeff said that he wanted Nancy out so Tonya could win the Olympic gold and get all the monetary opportunities that came with that. Eckhart suggested cutting Nancy's Achilles tendon, running her off the road with a car, or just plain murdering her. Jeff said that was a little bit overkill, they just needed her right leg out of action so she couldn't land her jumps. So in the end, that's what they settled on. The plan was set to action for early January, but honestly the whole thing was like something out of a comic, like Tweedledum and Tweedledee. And I say that because no one was seriously injured here, Nancy was fine very very quickly. Shane Stant was the one chosen to carry out the attack, and after Christmas he flew to Boston and checked into a hotel, staying there for two nights before deciding to go to the Tony Kent Arena on Cape Cod where Nancy practiced. 
On New Year's Eve, he heads for the rink, not realising that Nancy had left to go and bring in the New Year with her parents. So he checks into a motel room and just waits for Nancy to return, which she does on Monday, January 3rd. But the weather was awful, so she was only there for a very short time before having to fly to a costume fitting in New York and then on to Detroit for the competition. He completely missed her. Knowing that she'd next be moving on to Detroit, he buys a bus ticket for a 20 hour trip on a Greyhound bus. Once he finally arrives in Detroit after 20 hours, he checks into a Super 8 motel under his own name, just like he'd done at the previous hotels as well. And he was also clearly captured on the security camera. A hitman, this is not. Once in the room, he rented a video player and two adult movies, clearly making the most of his time on his own. He also made multiple calls to Arizona, Oregon and Detroit and he rented a brown car from an Alamo rental car agency from just down the road. As Shane Stant went to check out the Cobo Arena where Nancy was now practicing for the championships, Sean Eckhart goes to a grocery store back on the west coast and wires him $750. The same day, Derek Smith boards a plane and meets Stant at Detroit Airport. From there they got pizza and went back to the hotel. On the day of the attack, the pair went to the arena to assess the place and then Smith goes to get in the car. He parks it on the street where he could see the glass doors very clearly. Shortly before 2.40pm, Stan makes his way into the corridor that led from the ice to the dressing rooms. Moments later, Nancy Kerrigan comes off the ice and Stan approaches. He crouches and swings a baton into her legs as if it was a baseball bat. Her leg gave out underneath her when it made contact. Immediately, Stan then runs to the door to escape, but he realises that it's locked, it's chained and padlocked. They literally went to the arena to case out the place and didn't check to see if the door was unlocked. People would report hearing a frantic pounding as he attempted to escape, and panicked, he just lowered his head and charged at the door like an animal, forcing the plexiglass out of the frame and just crawled through. He jumped in the car and the pair drove away. Shortly after this, Smith phoned Eckhart and he wired him $1,300. And then their whole plan started unraveling very, very quickly as people who they'd confided to or who had just overheard them talking about it started to contact the police. Mastermind criminals, they were not. They were always going to get caught. They were called hitmen in the media, even nowadays people call them hitmen, but that maybe suggests that they were professionals. They weren't. These were just opportunists. The big question has always been, how much was Tonya Harding herself involved in this? The media narrative since would lead many of us to think that Tonya had personally been the one to attack Nancy, that she is the big bad villain in this story, that she was evil. But at most, Tonya was guilty of knowing about the crime before the fact, maybe for agreeing to it. When it came to the actual planning, the details, actually carrying out the attack, she wasn't involved, she wasn't responsible. A woman being absolutely vilified for over two decades for the actions of the men in her life, for the ideas of men, it's almost cliche. I am not saying that Tonya Harding was innocent, but the way this would sort of blow out of proportion was insane. What Tonya did eventually confess to towards the end of January was that she found out about the conspiracy to attack Nancy only after she won the championship and then she failed to give the information to the authorities. I would like to begin by saying how sorry I am about what happened to Nancy Kerrigan. I am embarrassed and ashamed to think that anyone close to me could be involved. I had no prior knowledge of the planned assault on Nancy Kerrigan. I am responsible, however, for failing to report things I learned about the assault when I returned home from nationals. Many of you will be unable to forgive me for that. It will be difficult to forgive myself. When I returned home Monday, January 10th, 1994, I was exhausted, but still focused on the national championships. Within the next few days, I learned that some persons that were close to me may have been involved in the assault. 
My first reaction was one of disbelief. And the disbelief was followed by shock and fear. I have since reported this information to the authorities. Although my lawyers tell me that my failure to immediately report this information is not a crime. Do you believe that there is... On the same day she confessed, the USFSA formed a panel to investigate this case. And on the 5th of February, they announced they had found reasonable grounds to discipline her, notifying Tonya that she had 30 days to respond to the charges against her. Two days later, the USOC, the Olympic Committee, announced that they would conduct a disciplinary hearing in Norway, completely independent of the USFSA's investigation. On February 9th, Tonya filed a $25 million lawsuit against the USOC because bylaws required that she receive 30 days notice of a hearing. This all kind of went back and forth for a little bit, Tonya's lawyers even questioning whether the Olympics had any jurisdiction over something that happened at a USFSA event. In the end, they cancelled the hearing and Tonya dropped her suit. She was going to be allowed to skate in the Olympics. Again, lots of people had lots of opinions about this, but they couldn't ethically have a hearing for the Games, so they couldn't stop her from competing. Had Tonya performed well at the Olympics, I imagine there might have been even more of an uproar, but she didn't. When they called Tonya's name to the ice, she was late to appear, like they literally had to start a timer, and she did turn up, but only at the very last second, and she was clearly very shaken up about something. I mean, by this point, the media had taken over her entire life, she couldn't even practice anymore because she was being chased. Famously, in the Olympic long program, she stops and skates over to the judges panel, hiking her leg up onto the desk and gesturing towards her skate. She had a broken lace. She ends up having to be given a re-skate by the judges, but this did not go well. She ends up finishing in eighth place. Nancy Kerrigan got the silver medal, and in a curveball that no one saw coming, 15-year-old Ukrainian Oksana Bayul got the gold. Things just weren't looking good for Tonya. Jeff took a plea deal in exchange for his testimony and later that year he'd be sentenced to two years in prison. Both him and Eckhart pled guilty to racketeering, while Stant and Smith pled guilty to conspiracy to commit second degree assault. On March 16th, Tonya pled guilty to conspiracy to hinder prosecution. She negotiated a plea deal to ensure that she didn't get a prison sentence. She said that she knew of the assault plot after the fact. She helped Galuli and Eckhart come up with a story and lie to the FBI. She got three years of probation, a $100,000 fine and 500 hours of community service. In June 1994, she was also stripped of her championship title, and then she was banned for life from participating in any US FSA event, either a skater or coach. That was it, her entire skating career come to an end. The US FSA actually has no jurisdiction over other professional skating events, but Tonya was blacklisted. No one in the skating world wanted anything to do with her, no other skaters, no promoters, no trainers, that was it. After the scandal, there was this huge boom in interest in skating. It propelled the sport even further into the public spotlight, in part thanks to her involvement, but Tonya couldn't benefit from this at all. And if she was involved, then probably rightly so. Since the incident, Tonya's life has been a bit of a roller coaster. Her sex tape was sold by Jeff to the media. She was forced to turn wherever she could for money, so eventually she profited from this. In 1995, her and her band, The Golden Blades, were booed off the stage in Portland. She appeared on a couple of TV shows and she eventually turned her hand to another sport, to boxing. She tried to become a professional boxer, but the career was very short-lived because of her asthma and in the end she had three wins and three losses. She'd also have more run-ins with the law over the next decade and she married again in 1995 to yet another abusive man and she divorced him the very next year. But then things seemed to calm down a bit. In 2010, she married her current husband, Joseph Price, and soon gave birth to a son. Tonya says now that Tonya Harding doesn't exist anymore. She's not that person anymore. Now she's Tonya Price and she's happy. She still skates regularly, she's still a very, very good, powerful skater, although she's not allowed to do anything with that skill. She can't even coach because then her students can't compete. But things did turn around a bit for her after the release of the movie I, Tonya in 2017. 
The movie features a double narrative told by Tonya and Jeff, played by Margot Robbie and Sebastian Stan, leaving up to the viewer to decide whose version of the story they believe. The movie is mockumentary style and is actually loosely based on the actual events, but it completely reframes the narrative around Tonya, the narrative of the previous 23 years. Finally, people could begin to see things through a more level-headed lens. Tonya was reportedly thrilled with the movie, I mean anyone would be thrilled by being portrayed by Margot Robbie of all people, and although it does take some sort of creative liberties, like the scene where Tonya tells the judges to suck her dick, Tonya says she wishes she'd had that much bravery at the time, she wishes she had done that. Although I will say that Tonya just continuing to be herself with the FSA against her and trying to force her to change is probably bravery in itself. Say what you want about Tonya Harding, but she was never anyone but Tonya. The only people who know the full truth about the Nancy Kerrigan incident are the people involved. The official version of events is that Tonya didn't find out until after the fact, although a later indictment did suggest that she knew more than she let on. But based on the media's reportings over the following years, you'd think that she had personally sawed Nancy's legs off. Nancy's career thrived after the incident, she turned professional after the Olympics, and she spent years performing in ice shows. In 2017, she was even cast on Dancing with the Stars, and then the next year, Tonya was also cast. So, was Tonya Harding innocent? Absolutely not. She knew something, whether before or after the attack, that she held back from the investigators. Did she deserve the narrative that she got? I personally don't think so, but I'm sure others will disagree with me. We're allowed to have our own opinions and that's fine, just be nice about them. But would things be different had Nancy been seriously injured? Possibly, but she wasn't. As I said at the beginning of this episode, people aren't black and white. Everyone has all the little bits that make them human, the good, the bad and the ugly. Tonya's past was made up of a lot of bad and a lot of ugly. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you found this one as interesting as I did. Make sure you check out Audible in the top line of the description box down below and go and listen to Ashley vs WWE. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.